So if there's something that doesn't make sense or is interesting or a thought triggers in your mind, share it, I'll, I'll hear it, and there's a chance that we'll be able to hold it right into the conversation. There's also a chance we won't be able to, in which case we'll just uh, stash it to the side for a later discussion over the next couple days. Um, and do that or, or whatever else. So again, feel free to interrupt. If I'm not getting interrupted, I might uh, interrupt myself uh, or or provoke you to to distract me. But anyway, here's the the overall uh, picture. We'll we'll look backward a little bit to see some of the things that led up to OLC C coming into being. We got this day one picture. I was just in uh, Rome. I'm gonna say two weeks ago. And we were at the Sistine Chapel, and they were describing the, uh, the, the creation, Michelangelo's creation, where he was just reaching, God is reaching to touch, and you have this creation point. We'll talk about this creation point as some interesting elements um, growing up from there, and some perspective of looking ahead. Uh, Frederick's going to keep me on time track, so we'll get to less of this if we run out of time. So I don't uh, feel over constrained. Just a little bit of reminders. When we talk about history, um, history has this interesting challenge of being accurate or less accurate, and it fails for a range of reasons. Um, and so some of the failures are intentional. That's this revisionist history thing. When I describe history uh, and what happened, I describe it the way I remember it, and I would like to remember it. And so things that reflect poorly on me. I may not describe with the same vigor as uh, something else where it clearly fits into my story. And I acknowledge that. I'm not trying to do that, but I naturally do it. Um, there's another aspect that causes problems, and I don't know how many of us are familiar with the parable of the blind men and the elephant, but the observation was these blind men were only able to recognize part of the story, frankly. They couldn't see, so they they heard part of the story and they kind of got their picture around that, but as they compared notes, they actually ended up with an accurate picture. And really that's maybe a thought for um, hearing me reflect, I reached out to hear others' perspectives, but in general, as we share our insights, it's helpful for others to be able to get a more complete picture. So it's a, a sharing responsibility, but also a listening responsibility. And I will also look for any opportunity possible to talk about this parable. So, so for prehistory, I'm going to go back as a starting point. You, you can pick how far back you go at any juncture. But I'm going to start with the Eclipse Project. Uh, just as a quick show of hands, how many people have heard of the Eclipse Project? Is that something that people, OK, good. So we're in a place where we've heard of this thing. Um, we started this. I actually led this effort. On the technology side, and we'll get to the place on the organizational side, I was pretty involved as well. But we dug into this. Our initial task uh, in this project, it wasn't these Eclipse yet, but it was to build a tooling platform. So a platform for building IDEs. And so that was the request. And the thought was that um, this would be an IBM thing. So IBM needed it. Uh, we were a wholly owned subsidiary of IBM at that time. We we're going to build this platform for IBM's use. As we dug into building it, uh, it became interesting and the thought was we can be more valuable for IBM's tooling needs if we actually do this as an open source project and make it available to a broader, much broader community. So that's what we ended up doing and we transitioned very early into that. And as we worked through it, we, we talked about the, the results of our efforts, and as we were as we were building, we would uh, share well history talks. We talk about how we're building things, and what became interesting to us is the Eclipse community was interested in the technology. They were interested in using the technology, um, but they were also interested in hearing how we were building the technology. This how it was being built was as interesting in many cases as what was being built. So we had these different things going on, and so we would talk in these various dimensions. One of the things that we would do as things were going along is we'd say, why is this going so well? Just trying to get a, an understanding of our own, 
in terms of what is it about this project that's interesting. And we ended up talking about these five dimensions, or the ones that we would draw attention to. And I'm just going to kind of look through this list with you. Um, and of course, I'm going to jump to my conclusion. So we noticed that these five dimensions were successful. So in subsequent efforts, we would look for these five dimensions. We can argue whether that was a, a good thought or, or not. But you can, I'm going to just project ahead in terms of what was going through our mind. So five dimensions of a successful project that's platform oriented. Uh, the first dimension, the first one on this list, I don't want to imply it in one way more than the other, but there's something about it that's compelling and tells the story of what you're doing real viscerally. Right? You just encounter it and you get it, you use it, you like it. Uh, and it, it kind of um, grabs your attention. And so in the case of the Eclipse project, is it had a job development tool in it. And people um, were interested in getting their hands on an interesting job development tool. They downloaded it, they liked it. Then they started asking questions about, well, how, did that, how does that tool fit into the platform house? What's going on here? Could I build something else? And it kind of inspired a range of things, both from, from using, providing feedback on how it was created, being inspired to do other things. And so that was kind of a key point. Um, having a platform is an important notion. So this ability of architecting for uh, extensibility, being able to add new capability, how can you do that and make it convenient? A community around this at all levels of the community. And the thing of having both users, having uh, people who are extending the community in ways that you intend. And one of the key elements, it's not quite here directly, but implied, is having people use the technology <coughs> in ways that you didn't expect at all. Right? So having application that's just completely different than you expect. We'd end up in conversations. Um, people would come by and say, I'm thinking about doing this. We had the NASA people um, who were involved in um, some of the Mars uh, rover work. And they said, you know, we're interested in applying this technology. And you work something, they're going, what do you have in mind? And they're, they're busy exploring possibilities. We won't go into the details there. But we didn't expect anything like that. So, you know, your technology looks a little bit young. We like that because we're going to be stuck using this for a long time. We want to grow up um, with you. And so having those unexpected applications in a whole, like in the Eclipse context, a whole range of those important characteristics, having this community doing interesting things, tools around this. And I know, sorry for going meta here, and I don't mean to. We're building tools, and then we built tools for tool creators as we were building tools, all that's going on as well. Skip the fact that we were building tools. The key point here is providing tools to help people use your platform really makes a difference. So we had a SDK that called the plugin development environment that people could use and that it bootstrapped their effort. So it made it easier for them to innovate. And then having a project that's not controlled by anyone makes a huge difference. So the Eclipse project spun up by IBM initially managed with a consortium. So there was a range of companies that were supporting the overall initiative and IBM was, so IBM was running it and there was this consortium of companies involved. Uh, and then we transitioned from that where it was goodwill and good behavior to setting up an independent foundation, the Eclipse Foundation. So my part in that is I was part of the team that defined what the foundation should be and how it should be and then populating the foundation and I was actually a board member in that initial foundation. So I kind of worked through that transition. But the importance of being in a place where people could safely use the technology. So jumping in and using something that's created by IBM is a great thing for people who are friends of IBM. Um, same for technology built by someone else. But if you're not as comfortable with that, it's important that you can go to a different spot. I take it 
big opportunity to interrupt you if you ask for it. So what you're talking here about Eclipse is pretty much what you probably later on refer to, to OCC, but what we still struggling with OCC, it's, it's still just, it's an IBM thing. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people are thinking that's, that's dominated by IBM, although IBM has drawn back from the community over the, over the years now, since they are not a tool, primary tool developer organization anymore. So what is, what is your, your view on that? How would you answer this question? Is it do still dominated by IBM or not? Right. So, so there's a factual question and then there's a perception question. And the facts and the perceptions don't always align. Um, but the reality is that IBM's role in OSLC has really changed quite a bit over, over the period of time. And it's not an IBM-centered activity at all. As we can see, by the population of this room, I didn't hear anyone say that they were an IBMer. Um, and I know that we're going to have some um, from IBM who are going to call in and, and contribute. We have people with IBM heritage and IBM connections, which reminds me of somebody, Ryan, if you make this comment again, or it triggers my mind, I'll make a, a further point down the road. But it's, we've stepped beyond that, but that doesn't mean the perceptions don't persist for some period of time. So I think the reality of interesting things happening. So I'm gonna come back to the showcase point, maybe once or twice, but one of the things that really helps the understanding is when significant activities are happening that are fit into that umbrella, so that it's tapped into us, we'll see that are coming from somewhere else. And as people recognize that happening, it really underlies the point. Anyway, that's kind of a punchline thought. What do you think? I am just a remark about the perception of IBM in OSS. As, uh, as Airbus, we are, uh, we are uh, speaking about standards. Mm -hmm. And we have a dedicated people uh, to promote the standard inside uh, Airbus as a step standard, ISO standard, and so on. And OSSC could be a very good candidate to be a standard. Mm -hmm. And the, the perception of these people is that, uh, yes, when I go to the, the site uh, OSSC, OMG, uh, we, we, we can see that IBM is uh, very dominant on the OSAT. So as a people uh, promoting standards in Airbus, mm -hmm. I cannot be uh, sell <laughs> uh, with, with IBM. So the perception is very important for industrial people. So don't, don't forget that. Even if there is five and so on, but perception is very important. And we, the, perce sure the perception mm -hmm. from, from industry is that uh, IBM is clearly uh, uh, a predominant people or company uh, promoting OSLC through uh, IBM Jazz, for example, and uh, is clearly uh, not an open, co an open community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so my next chart in prehistory is going to talk about this because I think it's important to kind of get this picture, but the, the facts and perception, hopefully I didn't say the perception went wrong. What people perceive is their view of things. So perceptions do matter a ton, regardless of the reality. But there is a fact that jazz is the only uh, platform. Everything else is smaller than that here and there. But if you want to point at anything to buy, okay, jazz. Yep. Even if uh, we have the capability uh, as an industrial like Airbus, uh, to use OSLC and to, to make open source connectors or whatever uh, according to our own tools, homemade, uh, IBM Jazz, like you said, is the only one. Uh, because the, 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 the strategy from, from industrial like Airbus is clearly to have COTS, core solution, big core solution, and no customization. So the, the, we change our strategy in terms of tools to say we don't want to, to make uh, euros on customized tool or homemade tools because we prefer to have big core solutions. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, we, are, we are in a deep sheet with uh, some, people, <laughs> some, some uh, tool vendors, but uh, like you said, uh, IBM Jazz is a very good candidate for, uh, for Airbus to say, yes, we have a, a big platform. It's great. Is everybody following along in the, in the Airbus experience here? Because it's really 
good to kind of get a picture of both the perception point and the reality, and it's going to help me make this next observation. There's no OS will see in, in existence yet. So the conversation is we worked on this project to build the Eclipse platform. We built the Eclipse platform. We res the result was IDEs and an IDE platform that was uh, well appreciated and had significant usage. Um, customers were happy. Um, IBM was happy with the, the nature of the ecosystem. And the question is, what's next? And so the thought was, instead of building IDEs, what can we do in the area of uh, team productivity? So instead of focusing as much on the individuals, focusing on teams, team needs, spun up a team to explore that. So I got, I got that job and um, started working on that. And we had this uh, thought in our mind. So we're, we're building something new. This is a commercial activity. Okay, so jazz, commercial activity by IBM. IBM trying to uh, make money and explore and learn. So that's what's going on there. Um, but we're thinking with our, our handful of five attributes and characteristics, uh, what are we going to do? So we're going to um, have this, um, some product that's going to showcase the platform. We're going to define a platform architecture. It's going to support <coughs> extensibility. We just did this Eclipse thing. It worked really good. It had a plug-in architecture will tap into a similar kind of architecture uh, for this jazz side that was uh, on our desktop. This will be on the server, but we'll exploit the same kind of things. Uh, open community, what can we do on that? It's really important to engage. What we'll do uh, is the way the product will be built is we're going to transparently build this product. So all of our planning, cast tracking, builds, everything else you can envision, we're going to do it in public. So we're going to do a commercial development effort, but we're going to do it transparently so you can see and engage, you can download the work along the way, provide feedback, and that, that'll be interesting. Again, we're just thinking out loud about what we can try, and what we can do, developer tool to help the developers out, we'll get around to that. We'll, we kind of said coming soon. And again, we're backing up here to 2006, five, six, seven. Um, and independent governance, well, it's a commercial product. We're not going to try to solve that problem. So that's kind of where we were at. We built this. Um, we were making a degree of progress. We had customers selling. And we're asking ourselves, how do we make the next tier of progress? What do we do next to, to engage and to grow and to make the next tier of openness? And we're trying to think through possibilities. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to kind of propose possible answers. I don't know if you follow it. Maybe you can imagine the discussion that was happening inside of IBM at the time. What could we do or should we do? Um, I'm going to just throw out a couple things that were explored. Um, one thought is, um, this worked pretty good with Eclipse. Why don't we turn Jazz into an open source project? So that, that was a, a thing that was considered. Um, you know, what else? start imagining a whole range of other possibilities. We stepped back and um, said, well, what kind of things could we do that could make a difference for solving the real problems that people have and the real challenges that are there? And we said, well, what are people looking to, to do? The, the, the pause here is, there's three or four different places we can, ways we can proceed right here. And so I'm trying to decide uh, which one to navigate on. And I already realized I've used half my time. But I believe this is the interesting part of the discussion, things that led up here and, and this. And then things are intriguing, but they're, they're more grounded in the today. So um, I'll go, I'm going to go down this path. There's some other things that are probably worth exploring on the, the open source side that, that are relevant. Um, but here's what we started thinking. If someone's consuming this solution, they need to be able to do it in an incremental way. So as people are looking, you can't expect someone to take a tool stack that they have and a solution that they're using or a set of solutions they're using in their organization and do this wholesale transformation overnight from one thing to something else. You need to assume there's going to be this incremental journey of 
a transition um, for this is on the consuming side. So those of us who are using technology, you need to be able to incrementally consume. So that's going to be an important characteristic of the solution. If someone's building tools and they're and they're playing along, right? So we, who knows what they're playing along with yet? That isn't the we haven't defined that. But if they are playing along, and this is I think OSLC before it existed, and they're playing along, it's important that whatever solution we come up with is something that people are going to be prone or open to playing along with. And so we didn't want to put constraints in the solution that said you need to implement in this language this way. We didn't want to say those kind of things, which kind of stressed some of our previous thinking um, and the path that we did in the Eclipse sites. We didn't want to do that. We, we didn't want to put ourselves in a spot where um, the vendors to play along couldn't have stand out themselves, right? So somebody is building a tool and they have this super cool idea. And it was great they had this cool idea. It was gonna be a product differentiator for them, but to play along with the system, that had to be discarded. That would be unacceptable. So you don't wanna define, you know, we'll just pick something. We'll say, this is the way SCM, um, source code management systems work. They need to have these capabilities exclusively to these capabilities, and we just um, make all sorts of control systems the same. They all have the same set of capabilities. That's uninteresting to somebody defining one of those systems because the reason their system is different than someone else's is because they think they're better. And that betterness needs to come out in the solution. I don't know if that makes sense, if you're hearing that or not. So we wanted to make sure that uh, the vendor companies who are going to play along could could do their thing and succeed in doing that. And then we want it open, to be truly open, not to be perceived as an IBM thing. So that's what was going through our mind. We wanted to make a step forward in openness, so we basically came out and, and made this OSLC declaration. I don't know if you can hear that, but we've been working along doing all this stuff here, there's not one drop of OSLC-ness, one drop of focusing on these characteristics other than generally, and we say OSLC. So th that notion of day one is really the case in this. It was aspirational, where we're headed towards, it was a declaration, and for anybody who was around in this time, but actually there was, in addition to the declaration, there was actually a degree of source code that came with it because our group really had this strong affinity to um, wanting something concrete at the same time. However, that code that came with it, I don't believe anyone in this room will likely remember. I, I had actually forgotten it. Um, time it, it's not tied into anything and it kind of uh, passed on as a, as a side point and we can we can talk about it later but it was this was a thought and a directional perspective and something to rally both the IBM side of what we were doing but also to step into the notion of community and on day one a range of uh, people who would be traditional IBM partners made comments that said, we like this idea, realizing we're talking about an idea. Right? So, so Mick uh, from Tastop uh, stepped in and said, great promise, and, uh, and others made some observations of that sort. But 2008, aspirations, vision, things are possible, we'll see what actually unfolds. Um, we made remarks, and I'm cheating a little bit on the timeline here, but not too much, but the characteristics that we're tr trying to express, and we'll do this over the next little bit, is the approach architecture of the web, technical specification, specifications inspired by real world scenarios, and a community around this. So that's the thought that isn't what IBM Jazz was leading up to that point. 
I just had a quick question because I think from, from my perspective, one of the most uh, interesting aspects when I discovered the OSLC was this uh, architecture of the web to rely on, on, on web technologies to implement those uh, integration frameworks. So I was just wondering when you create, when you thought about it, was it like, was it a bit like uh, ahead in advanced, you know? Uh, because it looked very modern even three years, four years after when I stepped in. Yeah. So when we made this assertion, we, we, at this point, it feels like it was the obvious thing to say and the right thing for us to do. We were pushing ourselves pretty hard at this point. We were not ready for that. And the work we had done in jazz leading up to that point didn't have that characteristic. So we had kind of bumped into a range of things and had a degree of challenges. To me, this, this is one of those cases of being right, but being right doesn't make it comfortable, easy, or the, the where we go from there, um, being able to navigate. If I could back up Taking this insight, if we could take that insight and put it back in this picture, mm. it would have been, if you could pick one thing to do to be uh, impactful on the OSLC trajectory, that would have been it. Mm. Um, the, the, the challenges in the, the transition moving forward um, to deal with that and understand and internalize what it means. I'm going to actually just go off on this tangent since you raised it. Um, what I've seen, so this is it's not looking forward with OSLC directly. It's watching how decisions and insights that are hard to figure out what to do with here. If you take people who've intersected with OSLC in these early days and the projects that led up to it, so this is looking at people, not technology. If you look at the people, they've scattered to the four winds at this point. But if you look at the projects that they're running and that, that they're doing, um, they've they've run this here. This here thought is deeply internalized in the work that they're doing at a range of companies. So envision uh, impactful. So I'm not going to say any names here. Envision impactful software companies right now, top five in the world. Um, <coughs> and people who are involved in these efforts are in those organizations leading and involved in efforts that are centered with that kind of approach at this juncture. But how come they're no longer interested in you know participating in the SLT? Like they just want to reuse it internally, the stuff and no, this isn't no. This the point here is they're tapping into the architectural approach. They're in new domains areas doing other things. I see. I see. And an interesting question that I have is not the why aren't they? It's is there going to be a reconvergence down the road, which we don't know yet. So that's a different question. Okay. It, it really hasn't made sense for a range of reasons, but I think we collectively somewhat understand in our gut, but not quite. And we'll, we'll try to tap into that. But um, I think that's a, a fun thought. But part of it, I believe, I'm going to actually answer it again. So one is, maybe there'll be a convergence down the road. The second is, if you have the ideas internalized in your solutions and you're tapping into them, what is the, where is the incremental part about this particular community that's giving it gravity? So we need to think through that as well. So again, I think it's a, a good thing to hear. So this here is astoundingly impressive. Not to show off, but this insight with nothing behind it, so it's, it's, uh, it's worth hubris, well understood. Um, so the degree of boldness to say something like this at this juncture is pretty astounding. Um, and the directional alignment is really pretty positive that we can look back at it. So this is 10 years after the fact and say, hey, that's really what we're doing and trying to do at this point. So. The fact that that came together um, in, in a creative moment, uh, trying to react to you know, all these pressures, including you know, we, IBM does want to make some money. 
and we want other people to make money as well. I, I mentioned this in the past, but one of the things about open source projects that's a huge positive is that they, and the, the openness thought as well, is they create a level playing field, right? So it makes it so that everybody can play in a, in a good way and engage in a very positive way. One of the things that we came to learn about open source projects is there's another way to hear level playing field, which is it levels playing field, as in turns everything to rubble. And that's one of the things that can happen with an open source project where opportunity for a lot of people to make some amount of money just turned into opportunity for everyone to give away a lot of free products. And it causes difficulties in investing, right? There's times where the open source side can work well, parts of the Eclipse thing work quite well, other times where it actually reduced investment until you can find the right synergies. Anyway, we were, we were seeing that and noticing that. So again, very happy. I'm, uh, well, okay, so what went from there? So bold, bold statement, over the next year, we needed to go from bold statement to, to making it real. And so we transitioned um, to telling the same story, focusing again on the style we had of hands-on, not being theoretical, but being very practical. So as we're doing specification work, we're doing it hand in hand with solving real problems. So identify scenarios, work through those scenarios, get a consensus on where we're going, put a specification around it, and run with it. So anyway, that's the thought. And so within the first year, we had it up and running um, in this change management area, so task tracking. We had made some progress, started stepping into a few other domains, made some progress on them as well. Um, we had some integrations that showed how you could do uh, loose coupling. So this architecture of the web thought and actually get UI integrations. Picture probably makes no sense, but I'll share two or three things here that we can trigger. We wanted to do the ability that you could look at a link and then hover over it, we call it UI preview, so you could see what was on the other end of the link without navigating to it. Right, so you want to tap into what's going on in that other tool. So we called that the UI preview. The other thing you want to do is you want to connect from here to there. So this notion of selecting a resource from somewhere else. You say, I want to go into this um, area. This is showing a picture. I want to go over into work items, even though I'm looking at a test case here, and I want to connect to one of those. How can I cross that boundary? So anyway, we came up with a way to do um, selection creation across that boundary uh, and a degree of query. So anyway, we had those pieces. And um, we, we tell, if you would ask, how do you do these kind of things today? Th these are the points you would make today, 10 years later. So basically in that first few months, we came up with a few things. We're basically in the same place at this juncture. Ran into a, a range of challenges. Um, First one was we're doing this thing domain by domain by domain, and a lot of what we needed was actually just the same kind of thing. When I talked about doing selection or trying to understand the capabilities that we have here to understand the resources, you needed something in common. So we created a core spec. Um, we were also allergic. We, We were uncomfortable with some of the technologies that were around um, in terms of describing data. And so we, we did everything with um, basically just straight XML at the start, which was not helpful. So we tried to step into uh, what would be appropriate. So um, we saw linked data as being valuable. We, we spoke to it as inspirational, but we actually started tapping into it and then worked with the W3C to take the linked data guiding principles and to establish the best practices around that. So that work occurred over the next several years. But if I would say the biggest technical challenge, it would be that of the technology that was built leading up to this, it wasn't built using this approach. And so the effort of tapping in and working through this was significant and continues to be impactful. And so what sounds like 
a small incremental task was actually a much more significant task because there weren't, at the point of OSLC's inception, any OSLC native applications that were built on. Okay. Last, last point I think to share is we talked about governance as one of the elements and OSLC, so we talked about the technical journey. There's a, we talked about that for quite a bit more. On the governance journey, we had OSLC being run by IBM, acting like we are um, benevolent and working in everyone's best interest. So that was the way it worked initially. Um, in 2012, and, and while we were doing that, we had work groups and we were engaging. I mentioned working with multiple organizations, so those collaborations were occurring. In 2012, we established a steering committee to actually guide the effort that included a whole range of organizations. There were six of us involved, including um, many of the organizations represented here this, this morning. And so we're guiding at that point, and one of the efforts, the challenges that we had is what standards organization should we adopt? Mm -hmm. So instead of IBM with best intent in mind deciding where we should transition, we actually set up this steering committee to make that decision and to guide things. So we did that and we concluded that we should go to Oasis, which then happened and that's where we're at now. Could you say something why Oasis? Why not W3C? Well, we did, so we surveyed all of these and what we were trying to do is to find one that gave us a fit for the kind of work that we were doing. So W3C is defining what what are the core concepts of the web proper. We felt like we were a layer above that. Um, and so we didn't see the good fit, even though, as I mentioned earlier, the work with um, the Link Data Platform actually is at W3C, and if you look at the transition forward. But it, what seemed to be appropriate for us is we're, we're focusing in these, these areas above, I'm gonna say application focused versus the core. Let us there. But again, transitioning forward, uh, realizing that we can't and don't want to think of OSLC as an organization as something that's a vacuum in its own right, but is actually interacting and engaging with many others. That's approximately the end. If I kind of draw the picture of where we're at, um, what I would observe is we have a platform at some level. We have a open community at some level where um, it exists. It's you know, focused enough that we can bring a group together like this, but not hugely expansive. We have now stepped into developer tools with, with the LEO effort, um, somewhat helpful. We have independent governance. <coughs> the showcase thing, not so much, just so that we're, we're clear, <coughs> we're kind of, in a difficult spot. So if we come, want to come around and inspire someone to engage, are we at the place we'd like to be? I think that's a fair question for us all. And my answer is we're not. We're not there. And the things that were shared this morning may be seeds of what that should be. But if I was giving advice, that's a place to focus. Is something that inspires towards OLCC doesn't inspire anyone towards IBM or towards <coughs> this or that or the other. Um, the fact that we have these other products is interesting, but what we want to do as an OLCC organization is we want people to get and understand OLCC because they get something concrete that it just resonates inside. That kind of weird sense. Uh, that's what I have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, John.